So hello and welcome to another episode of Interviews with Experts. I'm Frederick Dunn and this is The Way to Be. In this interview, I catch up with Dara Scott in his home in Ireland. Dara was my first interview in this series and it's time to catch up and find out what's new with Hive Alive. I made no secret of my experience with a scientifically proven Hive Alive liquid that I continue to use here twice a year. And then came the fondant patties that I now use as an emergency winter feeding resource in all of my Langstroth style hives, which improved winter survival in my apiary. Now I'm trying out the performance pollen patties as a way to boost nutrition in nucleus colonies that may need that extra boost while they build their brood. Here we are in July of 2024 and Dara Scott and his team are about to release another Hive Alive resource that's designed to help maintain colony health. Here's Dara. Hello Dara Scott. I'm glad that you're here today and thanks for engaging in this interview and we're here to talk about a new product that's coming out from your company. Want to tell us just a little bit quickly about where you are, what you do, and a little bit about the company that you represent. Sure. Uh, I am currently in Ireland. It's uh, nine o'clock in the evening. Um, my company is uh, Advanced Science, which the main products are high alive products. Uh, they're products for beekeepers. A good few, few, good, I presume the majority of people in the US at this point will know about high alive products. We do a range of products um, for beekeepers to use, mainly feeding products. Um, we start off with liquid, which is still the, the key main product. Um, it's been on the market now for over 10 years um, and it's number one in the world and it's the one that has science behind it proven peer-reviewed published data and science behind it which is what makes a real difference uh, oh, showing that yes so say that fast peer-reviewed published data people prefer <laughs> not my first time saying it <laughs> <laughs> i can't say it enough in fact yeah and you know what's interesting by the way um my my entire series of interviews with experts who do you think the first person was in the series that i interviewed uh, I, I have no idea, Fred. Who could it be? It was, it was you. It was me. Yep. February 3rd, 2022. You kicked off this entire series. Wow. Wow. So, That's, I, I, I'm, I'm flattered. Uh, isn't that yeah, great? Wow. Well, you, <laughs> you've always, from the get-go, you've always been a strong supporter of us. We really appreciate that. You know, yep. it's... it's I know you've gotten go from the back where people thought you're being paid to support some of that, but uh, that's not been the case. Uh, right now, in fact, people should know that this entire series and the people I speak with, um, this is just uh, to inform the beekeepers and talk about the things that uh, I'm interested in. Everyone knows that I'm also science-based, and so I really key in on products that uh, have been proven, as you just described, to benefit the bees. So, no, this is not endorsed. It's not an advertisement. This is just information for the beekeeper. And my audience is largely backyard beekeepers, but that's a growing demographic. And and you also are marketing your products to commercial beekeepers. And the feedback has been all good, right? Glad to hear it. Yeah, yeah. I've loved to hear that you've heard the feedback's good. We're here too. Yeah. yeah oh, yeah. <laughs> if, it, if it didn't work out, I would definitely, people are happy to share what they don't like. So, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, yeah. No, and uh, I would have to say that, you know, in this, you know, conspicuous product placement, but the syrup, she is, she is. the syrup just as described in the opening um, has demonstrated that uh, it's scientifically proven to work. And uh, here um, we did the Nazim accounts to see what the impact was on those, but uh, I'm sure it has other benefits that others have uh, noticed and observed in their own apiary. And uh, what is your, is that your top product right now? Because there've been other products that came out. The liquid has been, the, around the world, the liquid is our top product. Uh, it, it's it's the one that everyone can add to their syrup. It's the one really that probably offers the best value for money because you're just adding it to your syrup. You only need a small amount of it in there. Um, and as you said, it keeps the same levels low. It also breaks down the spores of other patches in the colony. It's also good for the gut, protects their gut. Um, so all those stuff and basically the bees do better with it. Um, second to that would definitely be the fondant. Uh, the fondant mm -hmm. has really grown. Our biggest mm -hmm. fondant has been making yeah. it quick enough. Yeah. Um, in fact, uh, everyone I know puts that fondant on for wintering where I am. Uh, it's a step up. By the way, I'd like to, if you don't mind, 
I'd like to mention some of the observations I made about the fund. And, and uh, I like to do micro and macro photography and video work. Uh, one of the favorite things that I used to promote it myself, dry sugar. Uh, you would just drop in the top of a hive. Some people call this the mountain camp method. You would put it on mm -hmm. paper uh, or make a sugar brick, right? So add moisture, solidify the sugar. And this cuts down on moisture in the hive and gives them the energy that they need to stay warm through winter. So it's an emergency resource. I made a shift when the Hive Life Fund came out, and we've spoken at different uh, gatherings of beekeepers and places where innovators talk and share. And uh, so I thought it was interesting to see how the bees would metabolize it. In other words, what's their access level, dry sugar, how much energy do they spend to collect the carbohydrates that they need from it. And then let's compare that to fondant. So um, the amount of licking that the bees had to do on the sugar brick to get mm -hmm. a resource from it, the, the amount of effort that they expend uh, because it's straight sugar. So obviously there's a good calorie boost for them. Um, mm -hmm. But then compared to the fondant, they were taking it much quicker and there were much quicker trips to and from the fondant. So, and I haven't, by the way, you know, we're talking about it in this interview, but I have not shared those videos. I made those early last year uh, and I saved that for my presentations, but uh, it was a clear advantage. Now, the next quicker resource that they could take in would be a liquid. So mm -hmm. the fondant was a great intermediate between a brick of sugar compared to liquid, which we don't feed in the wintertime here. Um, and then the other thing I was looking for the tongue of the bee is called the glossa, right? And it has hairs all over it. So someone said to me that, well, they're hurting their mouths when they're licking a solid sugar. And I thought, well, that doesn't make sense. They don't use their mandibles and so on. But then I realized what they're talking about. They're stripping away the tongue's, the tongue's hair. Mm -hmm. And so how would we demonstrate that? Get a bee to stick out its tongue and look at the hairs or look at the dry sugar afterwards to see if there was a residue of hairs from the bee's tub in and on the dry sugar. So, and then of course the fondant doesn't have that rasping effect. They don't work so hard on it. They're gathering the fondant and they're drawing it right in and then they're taking it down below. Uh, so the dry sugar actually was much more energy intense for the bee to gather those resources and also damaging to the tongue of the bee. Did you get, did you get photographs or something? Could you see I made, the I made videos and then I took the, I took the segment that they were working because they make little holes. If you've seen sugar breaks that the bees work it, they have these little holes where they, their tongues just keep passing through. And then I take that section away, put it under a microscope, and then I get in because I can't even with macro photography see those fine hairs, but with a microscope you can. Now, is it dramatic? Do they end up with bald tongues? No, it's not that dramatic. There's a few hairs, so you really have to hunt for them because they're also not in every hole. But it's also just another level of why something like a fondant would be easier on the bees and easier for the bees to get the resources from. So, and I know this isn't why we set up this talk today, but it's just these are observations that I make. And um, it was really interesting to me that uh, it kind of did back up that what some people were telling me, which is that you know, the solid sugar, because when we put in dry sugar, the humidity inside the hive causes that to solidify and it ultimately becomes somewhat of a sugar brick. So the bees are still working that, but they need water to do it, of course, so it has less moisture. But anyway, it was just an interesting um, observation that uh, aside from the effort that it's also to a tiny degree damaging to their tongue. We we get a, well, so, so I don't know if you get it as well, but we get ivy honey in the autumn, in the fall, and uh, it crystallizes really hard. And I, I tend to use, I keep it in, and I'll use it then for colonies if I'm making splits later on to make in the next year to make sure they have um, some sort of emergency food. But man, they, they are slow to eat that. I was just live there yesterday and uh, like the bits of ivy that were left are still right there in the middle of the colony where they should have eaten all that honey up ages ago, but they've eaten all the honey around it, but not the ivy honey because it goes rock hard. So it's probably a similar thing. It just takes a lot more effort for them to to consume it. That's interesting. What kind of ivy are we talking about? It's like a tree ivy. I don't know what the. It's, it's a general. Does it grows a, on the tree or? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's, there's a there's a ground and, and a tree one, but I think the tree produces the most amount of of, of the of the nectar. Uh, it's, I didn't know the name of it actually. Iberius, Ibris, 
It's, it's, I can't remember, but yeah. It's, so it it's, just, it's, it crystallizes um, fast and just becomes yeah, very, very, very fast. Yeah. It's yeah. very interesting. Okay. So if you would, I, you know, these are questions just I have in general, but describe your natural environment where you live. Like, what's the landscape like? Is this agricultural? Are there issues with natural areas being preserved? What's what's the climate and the landscape like for a bee? Well, I always say it's the worst place in the world to keep bees. Um, so they survive the heat, they survive the cold, but the wind and rain they're not so fond of. And that's it's it's I'm on the west coast of Ireland, as close to you guys as I can get. Um, so it's the Atlantic comes in, hits it all the time. So it brings in windy, stormy, rainy weather all the time. Um, so the bees have a hard time. The landscape is uh, very beautiful, I have to say. Uh, I've lived here all my life, but it's still very beautiful. Um, it's uh, I'm on the edge of sort of arable land to kind of bog land uh, up on the top of a hill, which doesn't help the wind either. But um, and it's it's I think. If it's mainly it's sort sort of uh, they they uh, the lands aren't farmed for for um, feed or anything like that they have cattle or sheep grazing on them uh, they're not they're not um, it's not intensive agriculture by any means and it's great so it means they got a lot of wildflowers um, the big one being being uh, the uh, blackberry uh, that's that's the the bramble uh, that's the big one for us. Um, but we get wildflowers throughout the year. There's a there's a hawthorn, what's called white thorn, that that can flower and give a big yield. Sometimes um, I'm not near any big trees, so I don't get any of the lime or the chestnut or anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, it's 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 very mild. It doesn't really freeze very less so in the last couple of years. It really hasn't frozen in a long time, and uh, it never it never gets very warm. I mean. It's funny, yeah. It, it it's rare it gets in the twenty. It, well, that was it. Rarely gets in the. What are you guys? So it'll be like eighties above eighty. It doesn't really get above eighty. Uh, it's and then what's um, oh, so then what's the low? Would you say so? So not below freezing anyway. Um, sort of just hovering above freezing a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, but uh, but generally you sort of mild. But but it feels colder because it's damp and windy. It always yeah. like. Go to places that are like it might be well below freezing and cold and dry and, and not windy and doesn't feel half as cold. Right. Um, yeah. So the the feel the feels like what they call the real feel is very different yeah. from the actual temperature. Definitely. But so yeah, cold definitely. and wet, that doesn't you're not doing a very good job. Are you just trying to keep people out of your area? Is that why you're <laughs> <laughs> No, it's no, it's it's it is look, it's stunningly beautiful. I, I have to say, like Connemara, yeah. you've probably or maybe heard of Connemara. It, it's 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 stunning. Uh it's really beautiful. And part of the reason it's stunning is because it is on the west coast. So it's rugged and it's sort of barren looking. And um but it's great. I mean, you don't come in the middle of wintertime, it's a grey and dark place. Um we're fairly northern, so we're up and kind of up the, the latitude, like the Aleutian Islands, nearly. You know, relative to to you guys, we're quite a bit more north, and it's it's the Gulf Stream that keeps us warm. Like the Aleutians get super cold because they get the the, the the Arctic Stream, but we're pretty northern, so at night time it gets dark. Uh, what times it get dark at? Like five or six o'clock, uh, and it's not bright again until eight o'clock. Um, whereas in the summertime, now now it's it, it's bright till eleven o'clock. Um, so which, which is nice and summertime's great like right now there's an arts festival in Galway there's an arts festival in Galway right now it's fantastic mm -hmm. after that there's a horse racing event before that there was a film flag it's only a small town it's got um, like under 100,000 people in it but there's a huge yeah, lost of them. small town under 100,000 people I don't know if you realize my town has 405 people okay so, okay. so <laughs> when you say small town that's very different from what what? I'm sorry. It's all relative. It's all relative. Yeah, I'm trying to China thousand. for in small towns were a couple of million. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then, uh, overall in Ireland, are there environmental issues or challenges? Are there people concerned about, um, you know, agriculture at all? Is there plenty of natural landscape still remaining? Because in a lot of countries all over. Uh, they have challenges with maintaining hedgerows and getting farmers not to use all the land just for crops or livestock. Do you have those issues there in Ireland or is everything pretty yeah. balanced? 
<laughs> yeah, no, that's perfect. Yeah, <laughs> not unfortunately. No, we we have that. A lot of it's EU driven, so a lot of it's the EU regulations. Um, you know, they can be a burden. EU regulations they're very strict, very strict to my business and all that as well. But there, but at the end of the day, they they do bring a standard that that is that is good. Um, so like uh, hedgerows is a lot, of, and there's there's a lot more grants now for farmers to leave land wild. But they have funding criteria and stuff like that, and it's it's not ideal. But they're working towards. There certainly is a big push now. Um, there, there's I'm trying to think now. So things came there on bees recently, where they're yeah trying to get envir- in, uh, different different. Um, uh, there's different the new funding now for more stuff. There's also a lot of funding for bee research and for for in the environment and how to protect them and that sort of stuff. Uh, and and it's not just the honeybee. Obviously, it's the other bees as well. There's about a hundred different bee species in Ireland. Mm-hmm. I'm doing salivary bees and mining bees and and sure. the bumblebees and stuff like that. And um, so, but yeah, the, the, like Ireland is is I suppose relatively unique in Europe in that it's not really really intensively uh, um, um, farmed. Um, I was in France there a while ago, and it's like you know big huge fields, not much. Th- no, it's still pretty good, but but not not a huge amount of of of, of wilderness. Um, yeah, and Italy's even, Italy's even worse. So I just work with an Italian researcher, and and he would be work on on bacteria of that, and he reckons that the soil in Italy has you know ten twenty years you know <laughs> left if that in it. Um, Italian so, soil has ten to twenty years left. Yeah, it's so intensely intensively agriculture before it just sort of stops, just just sort of dies. It becomes not useful yeah. anymore. I mean, you know, yeah. I'm going through France, looking at all the fields of wheat, and thinking that every time that wheat's harvest, they spray it with the with the herbicide to kill the the the, the, the wheat plant, so they, it dries quicker, so they can harvest it quicker. That's wow. that's all over the world. That's, that's wow. all over the. World. Yeah, and people, you know, I'd be a little rant here. People are always like, you know, oh, what's the point of organic? What's it for me? Like, but if nothing else, you're stopping that, you know? Um, yeah. So, yeah, the stent of, like, the herbicides being used is, is, is nuts. Yeah, that's very interesting. Now, in the area where you are, are there native honeybees there or are they a non-native species? Yeah, yeah. So, so that's something I'm I'm very passionate about, and I would have been involved in the setting up of what's called the Native Irish Honeybee Society. Okay. Um, it's basically the AMM Apis mellifera mellifera, but we've identified that that Ireland, I guess, probably due to its weather, has has its own ecotype. So it's it's slightly different DNA from 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 um, other be other other AMMs. AM, AMM would have been spread across the whole of Europe, uh, sort of from the bottom of France. Up and and over from Russia to Ireland, um, but because of selective breeding and people wanting different strains, uh, it's pretty much gone. Uh, certainly, in, in, in its in its original form, um, there is some in Russia. There's some in places, like possibly up in Northern Europe, up in like um, I'm not even sure about that. There are little pockets. I know there's a little pocket up in France. They're trying to keep some of that. So I'd be strong keep that people people bring in a lot of bees. They're you know which I get it why they do it. That they are going to be probably on good when we have good weather. They're going to be more productive. Um, but the problem is 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 I don't know. But what happens? It basically what happens is someone brings in a different strain of bee. Uh, their 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 drones will mate with someone's queen, and what you get is these really aggressive hybrids. And and I've been around. People got stung really bad from these aggressive hybrids, and it's just. I kind of think what we have is special. It's evolved with us, and I, 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 okay. Like I said, I get people bringing them in, but I, but it, it does upset me because it, it generally, what happens is people bring them in, do beekeeping for a year or two, and then you know do something else, and they've destroyed sure. what someone could have been breeding for the last thirty years. Yeah, and I'm glad that you hit on that because it is often a brand new beekeeper that looks around and finds out what bee is going to have a specific trait that they personally want, and then they're bringing it in. What for this native Irish honeybee society? What kind of influence do they have uh, over maintaining some of those original genetics? So, so to be fair, there's a couple of people doing an awful. I, I, I was only involved in the beginning. I'm not, re- I'm not really involved that much anymore. Um, I still respond to a couple of events, stuff like that. But the um, they've done a lot. Like so, they've made areas of conservation, voluntary areas, areas of conservation. Uh, they've done a lot of press, a lot of media work um, to really. Um, highlighted so people become aware of it because half the problem is people don't know what they're doing um they've lobbied with the government 
uh, the government repeatedly says, oh, we can't ban bees coming to Ireland, yet there's other, based on EU regulation, but yet there's other countries that have consistently banned other bees coming into under the EU regulation as well. So not really sure what's going on there. Um, they're trying to bring legislation to change stuff. Um, so it's, it's yeah, it, basically trying to get it recognised as, as a kind of an important indigenous species. Um, which it is. It's unique. And, and certainly for evolving in the west of Ireland, anything that survives in the west of Ireland, is, it's got to be unique. Well, that's what I was thinking. The climate that you describe would be very specific to the adaptation of a species, right? So uh, losing that species then would be a big drawback, I would think. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. Some of the stuff about it, like the um, like the 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 couple of things, like the 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 bees, the book fast, or sorry, not the book fast bees, but the, the indigenous bees, the the, the AMMs here, you know, they don't build up as big as quickly, and they're more frugal with their stores. Whereas whereas a book fast bee will, you know, build up super quick and make loads of honey. But you know, they don't know. Like I I've regularly, you know, built bees up for the honey flow, and it rained for the whole honey flow, and feeding them in the middle of it. You know, mm -hmm. and um. But even to the point of like um, even more local than that, there's a friend of mine, uh, Jared Coyne, who has bees even more west than I am, a good maybe 60 miles west of me. And he swapped queens with a guy in the middle of the country, um, John Somerville. And um, so so what will happen is is is, is the queens that, that, that Jared has from the far west, when they get over to the Midlands, they will start raising brood way later. Uh, than the ones that then then the ones that are already there, and say the opposite thing happens. The ones that go over far to the west, they start raising brood uh, much earlier, and you're only talking the difference of a hundred miles. Um, but the, the the difference in in the climate, the the bees have adapted to that hundred mile difference, mm -hmm. and they're 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 raising the brood in the springtime at different times because they know it comes a bit later over here. Mm -hmm. So. And I'm sure we talked about this before, but we can hit on it again. What inspired you to focus on bee nutrition and supplementing what they're already getting from the environment? Uh, what, what, what started off in the very beginning what, what was Nassima Serrani. That's what I was actually looking at the very beginning. Um, the, the, it had just sort of been kind of discovered what was going on. It was causing a lot of problems with bees. And I wanted to trigger something specifically on that. And that's what I end up making, which works with nutrition as well. But but it's a lot of it is keeping this disease levels low in the colony as well, which allows the bees to thrive. Mm -hmm. And for those who are listening, um, often they don't even know what disease we're talking about because uh, nosema, these spores are not talked about enough, in my opinion. And we had nosema apis before, but we're not finding that very often. So nosema... Serrani is the focal point because that's what we find most often in the gut of the bee. So how did you become aware of that? And what made you think that you could do something uh, to mitigate the impact on the bee's health? Um, it was getting a lot of press at the time, to be fair. Uh, and I, I know Spain was having huge losses with Nacima Serrani. Um, it's funny how it works. In, in some countries, you get really big losses. In other countries, you don't get the losses. Um, mm -hmm. But I've always been adamant about the fact that like in America, it's played down a lot. Same as other countries as well. It's played down a lot. Look, it's not really a problem, but I fail to see, and, and there's data to correlate as well, like, but I fail to see how, how a couple of million spores in your gut, that mm. actually the only way those spores replicate is by basically piercing your gut lining, destroying mm. the, the replicated cells in your gut, using the energy from your cells to replicate, uh, and basically tearing a hole in your gut in the process is not going to be debilitating towards a bee. And there's lots of stuff where they show like links with pesticide, um, uh, links with um, even varroa stuff like that, with the, with the virus of that. Basically, your bees, when they have Nacima serrata, will survive. They'll survive, but they're stressed. It's like right. only eating, you know, really bad food for you the whole time. But even worse, it's destroying your gut. So maybe, you know, drinking too much whiskey all the time. I don't know what the, yeah. the equivalent is in, 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 in yeah. human and I think the reason it doesn't get a lot of attention is because it's a sublethal impact that they don't deserve, they don't observe in a, in a dramatic way. They don't wake up and see a bunch of dead bees on the landing board or in front of the hive. It affects longevity of the bee, the overall health and resistance to other diseases on the part of the bee, as well as their, it reduces their ability to metabolize resources that they're gleaning. So it has an impact that you almost just need to do research on to even know because the backyard beekeeper is not, you know, understanding that this bee is living five weeks instead of six and a half or seven. 
And that extra week that it would have uh, been able to forage, for example, would have had a positive impact on the overall health and productivity of the hive. So sublethal impact is actually very important. And they focus uh, so frequently on the varroa destructor mite almost exclusively, as if that is the culprit and everything else is okay if we could just get rid of it. But this is another level of overall bee health, which could then, of course, help that bee sustain itself against the presence of the varroa mites and the pathogens that those mites bring with them. It doesn't eliminate the varroa mite, but healthier, stronger, more robust animals handle challenges better. Am I right? 100%. Yeah, 100%. I, I, I think, like, you know, if, if you don't manage varroa, you're, you're just you're in your nowhere. You can't, you have to manage varroa. It's such a big beast, uh, yeah. as small and all it is. Well, that... there is a reason why that is the focus, but I'm just saying there are yeah, a lot of yeah. other things we can do as well as. This is not in place. Of. Oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. I, what I'm saying is, is if, if there was no more varroa, you can guarantee there'd be a lot more focus on the semen surrounding. Sure. Yeah. And trachea mites and other things that we've yeah. all started to ignore. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so well, the, the new the, the new one, the the tropolapis mite. It's called uh, tropolalaps. Tropolalaps. Yeah, yeah, they call it tropy mite for short, so people don't have to say tropolalaps. But uh, yeah, we're hoping that that never arrives here. We're trying to fight it on the the current uh, colonies of bees where they exist. Doctor Samuel Ramsey is very Better. active and animated about that mite. Uh, because we have this, you know, well, we don't have it, we don't deal with it. reproduction is faster, this thing moves fast, much quicker, much more agile than the varroa destructor mite. So we can make everyone happy letting them know that uh, there's yet another mite that could actually completely wipe out colonies much quicker than the varroa destructor mite. Um, yeah, and I think it's not, not a question of keeping it out. It's like all these things, like in Australia, whatever, it's just a matter of time, it's just a right. matter of time to be ready for it. You know, that's kind of why I brought it up because I think that. Even I hadn't really realized how how real it could be, um, but it you know it's it's going to come to Europe sooner, probably well, sooner than the US. Um, and to put it in perspective, uh, entire regions there are other, there are some people that think we'll just let it go and then we'll deal with the bees that survive the mite and then they'll have resistance. Blah blah blah. This has wiped out entire regions of bees, entire commercial beekeeping areas have been completely obliterated by it to the point where they had to bring an entirely new stock. And I'm talking large areas. Mm -hmm. So for those who don't know what we're talking about, look at the trophy mite, tropolalaps, uh, and see what the impact has been uh, in other countries and see what it's done to the bees. So we definitely don't want that here. And I hope that, you know, through science, we find some way to cope with them. Mm -hmm. um, now, the products that your company has put out, uh, one of the newest things, I believe, last year was your pollen patties, right? Is that the mm -hmm. newest before what we're about to talk about today? That is the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one that we brought that out last year. We, there's, I suppose there's, there's two things we can talk about today. So if you don't count those two things, it would be the newest. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, and so the pollen patties, what's been the feedback on that and how are people using them? Uh, really good. Um, we're, we're out of stock, actually. So, yeah, we're, we're oh, used okay. to coming to speaker. So, um, um, yeah, uh, really good. People like them. They like the consumption rate. They like the fact that because of the 15% pollen in particular, those patties they really like, um, they, they, that they consume them quicker. They like that fishing place with a small hive beetle. Um, mm -hmm. They like the fact that hive live is already in. There's like a full dose of hive live in every single patty. So they like that as well. Okay. Um, we also do um, small boxes of them, so we do a box of two pounds, so two individual patties in a small box for people to have smaller, um, you know, smaller number of colonies or hives. Um, so that makes it easier for them to work with. Mm -hmm. What else do people say about them? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's it. It's really the consumption rate, the fact that bees really like it and do well on them. Yeah. And the time of year that they're putting those on? Yeah, that that's really surprised us. We we always thought it was going to be a, you know, re, it is still a, a spring food, but but you know, people use it like we could have sold an awful lot the last couple of months if if we hadn't run out of stock. Um, people use it all the time during the summer. I guess the dirt is a big one that people use it for, right. uh, and, and and also them they use it in the autumn because they want to make sure they got good strong bees going into the winter time. So right. so they, the nutritional boost before they make those fat bodied winter bees that have to live for months in the cold and the snow, right? 
Yeah, uh, there, yeah, because this happens sure. early on after they've done um, harvesting of honey. After they've done that, they're trying to recover some of the colonies. I think some people are using them uh, when they're building up nucleus hives. Um, if they're doing splits and making smaller colonies to get them robust enough to get into winter. Uh, me personally, because I wouldn't put them on all the hives, it's the little ones that I want to culture and build up quicker so that they can get in. As you described, uh, I don't know if you watch American weather, but huge storms have come through. And uh, mm, so some yeah. in some areas, they're challenged because they have a combination of a dearth and then foul weather that keeps the bees from foraging adequately. And that's an area where something like those uh, patties would then be able to be put on and that provides a smaller colony with all the resources that they need to sustain those periods in those um, times of dearth, as well as the challenges the weather's offering. And I think a lot of new beekeepers uh, don't understand that they've seen a, you know, a frame of brood and it's full of eggs and some of those eggs have already hatched. And so we've got young larvae in there. And then uh, without recognizing the challenge that's about to hit that colony, if they don't provide a supplement, and I'm not saying they have to, but they will sustain losses. In other words, they could come back, check the same frame, and find it empty as if no eggs were laid, as if there was no breed that brood there at all. And that's because the nurse bees, without the resources coming in, consume them. And mm -hmm. uh, this can help hold the fort, nutritionally speaking, and get them through that period so then they can resume when the next uh, floral resources are blooming. Is that a good description of how it might be used, or that's good? Yeah, but I also want to mention the the the, the research. Was I can't remember is the PAM uh, the the program Portugal for that 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 they sponsored the pro working with the commercial beekeeper feeding them protein patties um, okay. before winter time, um, and basically showed that the colonies that came out in winter after winter uh, were, were were stronger, particularly ones that had, ones that had pollen. Uh, that were fed pollen because obviously f pollen's are, are better than any of the substitutes. It's got exactly what the bees need. So, I mean, it, it's, it's always been the case with me. I'm sure you've seen it as well. The colonies coming in stronger, going into winter strong, come out of the winter even stronger. Mm -hmm. uh, colonies going in weak don't do not do half as well. They take a lot longer to build up. So by giving them protein in, 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 the, in the fall, uh, you, you're, you're ensuring that you've got strong colonies going. And, and it also allows a longer brooding, uh, brood period as well because they'll, they'll, they'll raise brood for that bit longer, which means that they don't have to live as long throughout the winter time, um, the, 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 bees, the winter bees. And you did you contract with Global Patties to have these made? Yeah, yeah, Global Patties okay. make them for us. And now I have another question. Since uh, we touched on a little bit the pollen substitutes that a lot of people use, how did you and why did you make the decision to use actual pollen in your protein patties uh, rather than some top performing pollen substitute formula that would have been tested? How much of a difference? Uh, really? Oh, it, 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 the pollen has 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 the complete balance of what they actually it's what they actually eat, what they evolved with over the last was it, 20 million years, you know, um, so it's it, it's key. Um, pollen substitutes are OK. Uh, they're just not as good. Uh, they don't have the same same as it's the classic case of you know, it it's only as good as where they're balanced. If you start having something out of balance, they can't use the rest of the protein. I'm not explaining that correctly. It's like a was it Randy Oliver had the example of of a, of a leaking barrel that if 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 you're if it's the struts in the barrel, let's say one of the ingredients, or one of the say, um, amino acids or something that the bees need. So if the if one of the struts is too low, doesn't have enough amino acid, all the rest of it pours out of the barrel because of the fact that you don't have enough of a balance, they can't use the rest of the amino acids if they don't have the right balance. So mm -hmm. pollen has that right balance. Mm -hmm. So and and there's yet to be a pollen substitute out there that has has a, a, a so the complete balance. amino acid profile. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, okay. and other stuff as well, but but it's it's, yeah. it's mainly you know, we have vitamins and minerals naturally as well, pollen wood, but uh, it, it's it's the biggest part is is the right balance of amino acids. Mm -hmm. It's hard to do. Um, it's hard to do synthetic or without pollen. And so once again, the reason that you said that you're sold out is because you anticipated the market would be near the end of the growing season. Yeah, we, well, actually, it's more more that spring was so busy for us, and the, with the, with the pollen, and then we were like, "Hold, we'll be putting an order in." Because the problem with pollen is it, it, has, it has a six month shelf life. Um, so, so we, we it's it's, a, it's an awful difficult balance getting that right. And we said, "Will we will we put another order in or not?" And we said, "Oh no, we'll we'll hold off uh, because we didn't want to be sticking around with stock over the summertime." Okay. But it was, it was, in hindsight, it was a mistake. We should have ordered because we would we would have yeah. moved it. 
That's a good question. So then the shelf life of your finished um, patties would be six months? Of, of the pollen patties, yeah. 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 They, they last a bit longer than the ordinary pollen patties because they have the hive alive in it, but yeah. um, they, they still, yeah, six months is about the number. Well, and what's the best storage for those? Uh, keeping them cool. If, you can put, if you're going to store them for longer, if you're not going to use them straight away, put them in the freezer. Oh, right, the freezer. So would you, could yeah, you, yeah, because po pollen protein degrades with time. Um, did so, you feasibly so, get more than six months if you had them in a freezer for the Yeah, time? yeah, you get, you get a year, year and a half out of them, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I'm glad I asked. All right, because they're expensive. I mean, why not yeah, you don't put want them right them. in the yeah. freezer? I would. And meanwhile, I've got mine sitting right over here on the shelf. He's fourth. And so let's talk about what's new, what's coming up, what's coming out. Oh, well, the, 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 the first new thing, which you've probably heard of before, is our new hive tool. We've gone to something that isn't a feed. Um, this is sort of taking the, the, the standard hike, well, the, one of the classic hive tools that is out there, and um, I, I just, just making it, in my opinion, better. Um, yeah. So we did a couple of things. First of all, it's super thick. Uh, it's really, really strong. It's three mils, uh, which means it's not going to bend when you're putting it on the supers which I love. Um, it's got a nice long, long bevel edge on it. So it's easy to slide into the supers. Um, some of them are a bit short and stubby. You can't get it in and under. Um, this, 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 this is fairly standard. You put it in, it's used for levering out frames, stuff like that. And the hook, the hook, I, I, there was so many, you know, I bought loads of hive tools in developing this and there were so many hooks that just didn't make any sense. They were, too too wide here. They were the wrong shape. You couldn't have to spend ages getting that right. And on top of that, you probably can't see it, maybe you can. Is there the there's serration there yeah. on on the hook, which allows you when you're levering the frames up out of the, the the box that it doesn't slip down in, which I used to find always being a problem. So it levers off that much easier to lift frames out. Um, and we did it in two colors. Um, cost of fortune to put it in two colors, but I was sick of losing hive tools, and by putting two colors, so the green. Well, the yellow is for is for if you uh, sort of lose it in a green area, and the green is for if you lose it like a grass, and the green is for you lose it in like a dry, brushy area, and still got the metal showing as well. So it's going to be a lot easier to find this hive tool than um, than the standard hive tools. So that green and yellow has nothing to do with your branding because those are already your colors. <laughs> uh, the yellow is more of an orange. It's more of the orange for the for the uh, for for the hive alive. But uh, no, actually, it's it's the golf balls. Um, okay. Where they, 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 they do a lot of research on golf balls, finding golf balls, and these these are the colors. Oh, that is that know. right? Okay, yeah. that's funny. Now uh, let me ask you: Is that stainless steel? Yeah, it's stainless steel. Yeah, and it's, so like a, it's does it work strong. on a magnet? Would a yeah. magnetic tool holder? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I use, so, I use a magnetic tool holder. Yeah. Yeah. So that people understand the difference uh, because I've seen people angry when they get something that's, oh, they said it was stainless steel and it a magnet works on it. Yes. 400 series stainless is magnetic. So it can be held with a magnet. 300 series stainless would not have enough air on the prison to be magnetic. That's the difference. So yes, if you get that. it, pardon? I didn't know that. Oh, you didn't? Well, I'm glad we talked today, but yeah, 400 <laughs> series is uh, what we call corrosion resistant. My background in non-destructive testing and inspection, so uh, we would uh, put stainless steel jackets on things that we needed to retrieve magnetically with 400 series, so that we could do that. So there you go. Cool, well, cool. Glad glad we added that, so we can we can settle that argument before it even comes up. Cool. So that's that's the hunt. I think that's that's. Pretty straightforward. Um, it, 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 look, it's it's very practical, uh, 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 and it's like there's lots of different types of hive tools. Um, I've used loads of them. This is by far and away the best design that I've used anyway. So, and I know I'm people mm -hmm. talking myself up or what we designed, but I, I I'm really happy with that. Yeah. And then the other thing is the little product placement here in the background. Now, see, can you can you see that? I believe Easy Feed Syrup. Yeah, so this is our new, our new baby. Um, this is basically syrup in a bag. Um, I can show you a bag of it. This is it here. Can you see that? Yeah. So this is um, just very briefly, but basically what it is it is is syrup. It comes in a bag that you can put directly on top of your frames. 
and the bees can feed directly from the bag. Um, it's it's syrup, it's inverted syrup. Um, I'll talk about the syrup in a minute, like, but but it's very it has hive alive added into it. Um, it's super handy. So basically, you you just basically you have your box handy, whatever, whenever you need. Every got the eyes, bees need food. Put it on. You put a couple of holes in the top of it. So the bag, you put it on the box on the book here, so you can see it easier. So the bag is designed that the there's a flat part which is sitting on, and then there's a raised dome part. Okay. And so the idea being is that you you put on top of your frames, you put some holes in the top of it here. Simply you lift it, lift it a little higher because it's off. Sorry, yeah. Oh, there you go. Okay. Oh, so it's not just like a Ziploc baggie where it's the same on both sides. Exactly. So flat, flat bottom and a dome, dome top. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so basically you pierce the bag a couple of times to get the bees access to it and the bees will come up and feed it. And because again, because it's high alive, it'll be much even quicker to take out because they'll know the smell straight away. Yeah. And they'll go up and take it. Um, the beauty of it is, is there's zero mess. Um, there's zero issue of washing or cleaning up afterwards. It's super quick. You have it there when you need it. You can put a couple of bags on at one time. You've got a big colony or just just the just a, uh, a single bag, depending on what you want to do. Um, if you just want to do a stimulant, for instance, in springtime, you just might put one bag on, or maybe a fewer number of holes. In the autumn time, you want, might want to have a couple of bags on and have bigger holes. They can take it down quicker. Um, it's a two to one syrup. Uh, it's uh, it's inverted syrup, so it has the the right blend of uh, fructose and glucose in there, um, so, which is which is important. Uh, no high fructose corn syrup or anything like that. I, I, okay, I, I wouldn't want to use that in the same way. I don't. I use pollen in my paddy. I like to make sure I've got all the, the right ingredients. Um, what else can I say about it? So it comes in a box of of nine. Uh, they're two pound bags, nine of them in in a box. Um, yeah, what kind of, of really uh, what kind of clearance do you need on top of the frames to accommodate about that? About an inch. I mean, your standard ink will do it, no problem. Um, it's about an inch. Okay. Now, how long have you have you had this out? Obviously, you must this, have done this some is... testing, so. This are we doing testing ourselves? Yeah, that's why I have it. This 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 is this is not out yet. This is coming out. It'll be in the states in the next couple of weeks. No, oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah. This is this is all very brand new. Um, we yeah, we've been working with the manufacturer this for a long time, and yeah, really happy with it. So now, how would this compare use wise with the fondant that we're currently using? So the fondant. The fondant was always designed to be an overwinter feeding uh, thing, and it's actually the fondant that gives the idea to do it because what happened, we realized, is a lot of people who are using the fondant all year round, yep. um, and and that's fine; they can use it all year round. But this is sort of a, a quicker way of them to take down feed. It's a more practical way to take it, mm -hmm. um, they can store this as well in the comb. They tend not to store store, store fondant in the comb that much, um, whereas they'll store this in the comb, uh, and it has the advantage too as well as that. With Hive Alive, um, when it's in syrup and when the bees are taking it down and storing in the comb, it's working better because what it's doing is the, the Hive Alive is breaking down spore walls of pathogens uh, uh, that are in the colony. So whether that's um, bowel broods or nosemas, it would break down the spore walls. So you basically, you're sort of cleaning out your hive in the process. So you have a, a, a lower disease, a lower pathogen level in your colony, which is one of the reasons why the colonies do so well when they use Hive Alive. So by using this syrup, um, you're, you're allowing that to happen. Whereas the fondant, they don't tend to store in, in, in the comb. Right. Now, so how does this differ? It is invert sugar. So how does this differ from when people mix up, let's say they mix up two to one themselves, and then they added the high life syrup to it. What is different as a two to one premix in this bag from what they would make themselves by mixing um, it up? So other than the convenience of the bag um, is that th this is made uh, with enzymes. So you're not heating up the sugar syrup. So you probably know about HMF. Um, mm -hmm. That's 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 a, a, a toxin for bees that get that, that's made when you heat up sugar syrup. The longer you heat it up, it's particularly in high fructose corn syrup. But um, 
and it'll also be made when you're making it up at home because even your tap water can the, 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 the pH of your tap water can influence that as well. Um, so this this doesn't have any HML, like it's like zero or something like that. Whereas you can easily make it at home if you heat it too much to have a level that's verging on toxic, especially if you're storing it, because the longer it's stored, the more the HMF builds up in the heat in particular, if you store it in the heat. Um, what else? You've got the high I've already mixed into it, so that's easy. You know exactly got the right amount in there. Okay. Um, and oh, yeah, the other thing as well is when you're making up, it's not a huge deal, but when you're making up syrup, in a pot or whatever, some some heating, whatever you want to do to make your to make your your, your two to one mixture. Um, what you're in the process of heating, what it does is it breaks it down into the, the fructose and the glucose and and the sucrose. So it's very hard for the beekeeper to know what's at what stage do I stop heating it to know it's at the right ratio of fructose, glucose, sucrose. Mm -hmm. um, whereas this is at the right ratio. And, you know, it's, it's, it's 40, 30, 30 is what it is. 40 for the fructose and, and 30 for the glucose. And the, so if uh, someone purchased glucose. those, what's the shelf life on that mixture? Shelf life is a year and a half on this. Year and a half, so 18 months. And storage requirements, any special considerations? Just keeping it cool, really. Not, not letting it stick out in the heat. Um, Could you put it in the freezer? I wouldn't, no. <laughs> Could spend, I wouldn't think that'd be a good idea. So it's I not a good idea. I'm yeah, glad you mentioned that. Right. Okay. Because it wouldn't actually freeze. It would just be really cold. Yeah, it but wouldn't it wouldn't be solid. Yeah, well, it probably wouldn't expand that much, but... Oh, you're worried that it would expand and... Uh, yeah, burst. Defeat yeah. the bag a little bit. Yeah, that's yeah. The, you don't want that in the freezer. Okay, good. Yeah. I'm glad yeah. we mentioned it. Yeah, that could go awful wrong, really. <laughs> okay. Now, and I'm sure instructions come with it, but what yeah. size holes and how many holes would they be putting on the back side of that? You, you can just do small holes like um, uh, people use um, cocktail sticks or, or things like that. They don't have to be huge holes. You can also put slits in it, but you want to be very careful. You put a slit in it, it'd be very hard to move it again or anything like that, you know? So you okay. just put, put put multiple small holes and putting a big slit in it. But if you so, want them to take them quick, you could put a slit or two into it with a, with a sharp blade. So you haven't considered including like a paper clip or something to poke holes in it? it comes no, but you can use the hive tool. Look, look, look at it. Yeah. It happened to have one of these amazing tools. You could... Yeah. <laughs> just hit it with the corner. Just, just, just yeah, the just corners poke it. a couple of holes. Yeah. 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 Exactly. All right. So, and that's going to be available in August. Yeah. Yeah. Probably, probably the middle of August at this stage. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, well, we, we actually uh, think we're going to be. I think we'll, we might. Have, I think we're going to have pre-orders on the website. I'm not sure if you're interested in checking out. We, we probably will have pre-orders on the website for that as well. Okay, uh, it quickly so, go, so what's the forecast price point on that here in the United States? Uh, it's about fifty bucks, um, which works out if you're buying. You know, if you're buying a gallon to a syrup, it works out sort of uh, cheaper. If you're buying large volumes of of you know, if you're buying a half a total of syrup, but it's definitely more expensive. Um, but it's more the convenience what you're paying for there. Um, okay. Yeah. So you get how many packs in a box? You get nine packs. The two pound packs. Okay. All right. What else should we know? What's going on? Anything? Uh, we just finished our new website. We've been busy finishing the website. We were just moved to a new warehouse. We were having lots of hassle with delays and stuff like that, with orders, stuff like that. So mm -hmm. we moved to a new warehouse to speed that up. It's still in the process, but certainly by the middle of August, it will definitely be sorted out. Uh, it's it's in, sorry, it's 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 happened, but you know, yeah. it's still the odd teething problem with the new warehouse, but it's going to be a lot quicker and a lot more efficient. Uh, um, yeah, just little things like that. Just trying to make you know a better service for the customers to make the whole process easier. Um, we made the payments easier as well, stuff like that. That just makes it, we're having people you know, whose cards would get accepted randomly, and that's that's gotten fixed as well. Just all these teething problems. It's, it's sure. yeah. Business, well, and so last year things. I remember everybody wanted their fondant, so I always I always take care of myself first and get mine, and then I tell people about stuff. But. Uh, very wise. They, they needed fondant, and they didn't. It, there was a fondant shortage there for a while, right? Yeah, Last yeah. fall. Yeah, we're better. We're better with that. And the very beginning, though, it was nuts. We just couldn't make it quick enough. It just was. Just was nuts. But now we can. We can forecast better. You know. 
And I think you're Thank right. You. It's it's the convenience because the fondant packs, my grandsons are helping me now with beekeeping and uh, putting fondant packs on top of the inner cover was a huge, for the past two winters, has been a huge bonus for us here. And uh, I did make the mistake and leave some of them on longer. What is a drawback? Because here we are in July and we were doing a hive inspection two days ago and I found a fondant pack on it. What's the drawback to leaving your fondant on for six months? <laughs> I don't think there is any. Sometimes okay. they can go a bit gooey and ugly, but but or but it it's, almost it's, solidifies. It it actually dries out. It gets really stiff. Right? Yeah, yeah, and then you'd be slow to take it down, and you can melt that down again and use it, put it into syrup if you want to as well. Okay. Um, yeah, actually, it's something I, you know, the fondant thing as well. It's something I I kind of want to push this winter time. So like, I suppose. Part of the cause of fun is people start buying it much earlier than we thought they were going to buy it. We thought they'd be starting buying it in like January, you know, maybe December. But people start buying it in, in August, uh, September, you know, very early in the year. Um, but I, I do genuinely believe that, that a huge amount of losses can be prevented from using the fondant because so many people have their bees going into winter with not enough food. Right. They think, oh, Roa got them or whatever, but it's either the food wasn't enough food or the food was too far away from them or whatever it is that it happens. It happens so often. So right. um, I, I think there's an awareness thing to go out there as well that, 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 that just by having the fondant, you just, it's, it's there if they need it. It's, yeah. And I, it, and I do want to hit on that again, that um, because I'm one of the people that told people for years, well, we didn't have a lot of options. So putting dry sugar up was better than nothing. Um, but the bees' ability to transfer that through the, the winter cluster, those resources, uh, the dry, the sugar breaks, the dry sugar, it, it can work, but it doesn't get to all the bees. It doesn't cascade through them. Uh, because I have observation hives, we get to see when they hit a resource that they need to survive, and then they spread that around mouth to mouth to all the other bees through the hive. Uh, the fondant accelerated that so much. The dry sugar, it was almost like the colonies that consumed it were colonies that were so strong, they would have been okay anyway. It's, it's. I mean, it is an emergency resource, but I think the fondant was a step up from that. So that's why the Hive Alive fondant really did uh, benefit what goes on with my bees, because other than that, sugar or nothing. It's what, I didn't have anything else to put on it. So that filled, and I wasn't confident. I'm not a cook. You know, I'm not going to make my own fondant. For the same reasons that we described, you could produce HMF, you could have it too hot and so on. Uh, the other thing is like with the high life syrup, um, even when we create two to one sugar syrup or something like that, it has to be cool before you add the hive alive. I believe it's under 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, what happens to it if you put it in while it's still a little too hot? It's okay, but the, the seaweed extracts in particular, it's, it's the active seaweed extracts, the antibacterial, antifungal, that stuff, they, they don't, they're, they're quite sensitive to heat, so they don't work as well. It's not going to okay. kill them or be toxic to the bees or anything like that. It just defeats some of the benefits. Yeah, yeah, you're just, okay. you're just not getting a good value for money as you would be if you're buying the thing. But yeah, there's, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a line, it's better for, better for the bees to be looking up at it than, than looking for it. So when it comes to food, and, and it's not even, it's actually not even, really in the December time period is the period just before the first flow. Mm -hmm. That's the time you lose your bees, you know? Sure. It's the period yeah. when they just run out of food or the food's way out on the edges and maybe it's cold and they're back in a cluster and they can't go out to food and like, oh, what do we do? And literally they're, you know, you know trying to get at the bottom of the cells trying to get all the food out. But if there's food right above them they, and because they heat the cluster, they can go, they can go up. They can't go out, but they can go up. Correct. Yeah. Be there for them. Yep. And that has to do, again, with the, the smaller colony size that they don't have the extra workers to take that risk to bring those resources into that cluster. And once they brood up, they're locked in. So it's very important. Yeah, absolutely. All good stuff. All great information. Are there any uh, expos or any conventions going on here in the United States that you might be attending? Linda is going to, you've met Linda, haven't you? I think you met Linda. Maybe you haven't. Then let's go to EAS. Um, she, and then we have another one we got. What's next after that? I think we generally go to the HPA. We go, we'll go to NABI as well. And, we and that's write in this January? Show. Yeah, yeah, NABI. yeah. Okay. And there's a couple other shows. So there's the um, ABF at the same time. And there's another one we just got wind of as well around the same time. What is it? From your, your area, I can't remember. I was just on email. I was actually recently. 
uh, that's that's just towards the end of January. So we're kind of thinking maybe we might just hang on and do all three shows. Now, um, do you do you post anything on your website that lets people know where they can come and meet you, which um, conventions you're attending? So that we, they, we put stuff know, on Facebook. We have a Facebook group as well. Um, okay. We put stuff on Instagram. But you know what? I don't know. To be fair, I don't know if we flag it enough of what shows mm-hmm. we're going to be at. That's that's a good point, yeah. actually. I think it would be very helpful because I know a lot of people just want to want to see it. They want to talk to people direct. You know, they want to see kind of what's going on. Also, they want to get those specials where they pick it up without paying shipping and things like that. Yes. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Oh, I forgot. We have another new product. We've got T-shirts now as well. We're, we're all very, we're all very marketing now. <laughs> yeah, T-shirts. So you have the merch. Where's the T-shirt? Do you have one handy? Uh, I don't have one handy. No, I can run across. No, but I don't have one handy. That's, no, no. Okay. You, you don't have on. a T-shirt. I need, to, I need to give you a T-shirt. Yeah, I would wear t-shirt. one. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. We just have um, a t shirt. Okay, so you have t shirts. 100% cotton. Organic. 100% organic. organic cotton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I said, we don't mess around. Okay. I, I just, again, it's the same thing. You know, you think about cotton fields being sprayed with chemicals the whole time. And it's like, no, I, 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 I don't buy into that. That's just, there's a, there's a shelf life on that. You yeah. Know, now, do you have, do you have, you have cotton in Ireland growing? No, there. no, no, no. No. So, all right. So I can't ask you about cotton honey. No, you can't. Because I guess beekeepers that live near cotton fields, I guess their bees are on those blossoms. So I think it's a, it's a nectar flow for them. We don't have cotton where I live either, but a lot of the Southern beekeepers swear by those crops. So I had um, buckwheat honey for the first time there in France. Um, Yeah, that's black. pitch Very strong, very dark. Yeah. 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 And buckwheat in your head, you think of it as a wheat, like a grass, but it's not. It's it's very different. It's almost a milkweed looking. Yeah. 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 It looks like a weed. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very, you know, that's, it's a strong full bodied honey that, you know, people like and you either like it or you don't because it's a very strong dark honey. So that's great. Any closing thoughts or comments that you have for anybody listening? No, no, just thank you for, for the time, really, of, of letting me speak. It's great. It's great to be able to talk to you and your your listeners and, and, and be able to tell people about our products so they can learn more and make a decision then if it's for them or not. Um, no, looking forward to catching up with you again. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, I think your name was on the show that I'm thinking of, the ones at the end of January. Are you going to show at the end of January next year? Uh, I could be. I'm going, yeah, you're I'm, going, I'm going, going to a lot of places yeah. right now and I'm I'm bad. I don't list where I'm going to be. I just like to show up that way because if people knew I was there, they'd know to avoid it. So I surprise them and ambush them. It's too late for them to get out of the auditorium. So. I was thinking the opposite. There's so many people going there. You <laughs> yeah. put the whole place down. Yeah, all right. Okay, well, thanks a lot. It's been great talking with you and thanks for sharing about what you're producing there in Ireland. All great well, stuff. Thanks very much. Thanks very right, much. Thanks.